Hi, this is John Swen. The date is the 19th of February 2023. This is originally posted on the YouTube channel Expose the Enemy. I have a website where works of others and myself are published, along with a great deal of compiled research sources. That's exposevenemy.com. You can support our work by joining this channel or becoming a patron at the link in the video description. So before I began publishing and creating content publicly, I had um, been on top of this whole Cambridge Analytica Facebook story as it emerged and I was specifically focused on the Mercer family and their connections to Cambridge Analytica, the Republican candidates for the 2016 presidential election, the Council for National Policy and Breitbart and certain people like Steve Bannon and Kellyanne Conway who was linked to the Trump campaign. Anyway, I wasn't happy with the way this topic was being covered and felt information that others had found, along with what I'd pieced together, weren't getting much attention, weren't being presented correctly, and that the issues surrounding the story were being ignored, especially in the pro-Trump alt media circles. Anyway, I continued on piecing things together and started presenting things publicly and making videos and such and then I carried on and then I finally made this video on private intelligence networks and put it out for free. I was slightly optimistic because I had faith that well-meaning people who really do care about our future, who understand the consequences of the power of this technology at the disposal of the hands of a Robert Mercer or a Donald Trump Benjamin Netanyahu etc. They would get this information out to people and many did and that video that became the most watched video on this channel and to be honest that was one of the few things that gave me the motivation to continue with this work because shortly after that Covid hit and well support hasn't been good for many reasons. There are plenty of well-meaning people who want to help but aren't in a position to. Some have been driven into their shadows, some people have died and some have just become so toxic I can't rationalise communication with them. And anyway despite all the years of work and content there's only really one person with any kind of platform that's really helped to share our content. So it's really down to people watching this to get the information out to people. Anyway regarding this whole Cambridge Analytica and Facebook story. I just wanted to share a bit of backstory for context with what I'm going to be talking about here. So when the news started breaking about Cambridge Analytica being used by the Trump campaign and Brexit campaign to target Facebook users, a couple of whistleblowers came forward. The first one was Christopher Wiley. Then after all this information had already come out, Conveniently, this other quote-unquote whistleblower stepped forward called Brittany Kaiser. At the time when Kaiser stepped forward, I felt it was disingenuous. But what more can you expect, really, from someone who worked for a company like Cambridge Analytica, knowing what they were involved in? In my opinion, it was a case of too little too late. The damage had already been done. So I got the sense that Kaiser was blowing a whistle to try to save face because for one if she didn't there was a strong possibility her role would have been revealed as journalists started looking deeper into the information that Christopher Wiley revealed and she would look really bad also if she got the opportunity to get ahead of that information coming out and put her own spin and control what she wished to reveal Maybe she could bury some of the darker information regarding her role during her time working for the company. And there is the opportunity to rehabilitate your career and redeem your name and brand yourself as a data protection advocate. A cryptocurrency grifter become a part of a World Bank Institute and a lawmaker through being a subcommittee member of the Congressional Select Committee on Blockchain, Fintech and Digital Innovation. 
which brings us to another reason the opportunity to sell her story in exclusive interviews get a book deal and have documentaries and movies made based on your story and of course get the opportunity to promote all this on Democracy Now! One review of the Great Hack documentary said Kaiser was presented as a kind of fraught hero seeking to atone for her privacy invading sins. We know in reality she was happily exploiting your personal data for her clients and benefited financially greatly from it. And I will re-emphasise that she only became a whistleblower, quote whistleblower, when it became convenient for her and after Christopher Wiley had already come forward. Speaking of Christopher Wiley, this tweet is referring to a 2015 campaign that Cambridge Analytica worked on during the Nigerian presidential election. The project was called, quote, Team George. It involved an influence campaign that used graphically violent imagery to portray a candidate as a supporter of Sharia law who would brutally suppress dissenters and negotiate with militant Islamists. The information came to light when Christopher Wiley became a whistleblower. Now ask yourself which country's relationship with Nigeria might be jeopardised if good luck Jonathan was to lose the election to Muslim candidate Muhammadu Buhari. Israel maybe. This is from a UK hearing on Cambridge Analytica in 2018. Notice how Kaiser gives no information confirming names of Israelis or Israeli companies. How she completely downplays the significance of the project in Nigeria, the work and the role of the Israelis and her role in the project. She also conveniently, erroneously claims the election was moved forward when in fact the Israeli company, quote, release footage they obtained from polling places that succeeded to get the election postponed for six weeks, unquote. The idea behind that was the project would have more chance of succeeding with more time, hence gave it Good Luck Jonathan's campaign a better chance of winning. He lost regardless. I, I wanted to talk about um, your evidence about Nigeria. Mm-hmm. Um, and... In that evidence, you quite rightly say that opposition research is part and parcel of politics, mm-hmm. um, uh, and that you uh, introduced a, a suitable opposition research company, um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, which was not called Black Cube. No. What was it called? Um, I don't remember, actually, to be honest. I never had a contract with that company. I introduced them to the client, and they contracted individually. But they were suitable? as far as they presented to me, um, but I didn't know any other opposition research companies that had experience in Nigeria. You so. can't remember the name? Um, no, but I can try to find it for you. Please. Yes, um, definitely. We, we are, um, but obviously opposition, sort of legitimate opposition research doesn't include hacking into people's personal details, their medical records, or any, anything else that might be embarrassing, including criminal records or whatever uh, uh, might, might be available. Um, and there was a report in The Guardian uh, regarding this, this uh, um, now infamous company, Black Cube, um, that said that, that um, it, I'll quote it, it was The Guardian on the 21st of March this year. Um, uh, staff working on the campaigns, this is Nigeria, say in early 2015 they met Israeli cyber security contractors in Cambridge Analytica's offices in Mayfair, London. Employees say they were told the meeting was arranged by Brittany Kaiser, a senior director at the firm. Is that mm-hmm. true? So I was in touch with my team that had been in Nigeria and had been working with these people on the ground. I wasn't aware of what work they had done, but I did know that they were coming to headquarters to present some information that they had obtained from the opposing campaign. So they came to the office for maybe an hour one day and plugged something into a computer to show some pieces of information that they had obtained from the opposing campaign. Now, I wasn't working in operations on this campaign. We had a full team that was sat in the Abuja Hilton, in fact, um, that was running this on the ground. It was only a three-week campaign, um, so this wasn't uh, a campaign of much significance, to be honest. Um, But they had obtained some documents that uh, said that the other candidate had visited hospitals, um, that the other candidate was being consulted to by my former boss, um, David Axelrod, 
uh, and he used to manage the Obama campaign when I worked there, yep. um, even though David had said in the press that he was no longer working for them, um, and then a lot of other miscellaneous information. Now, the clients didn't find any of this useful at all. Um, it resulted in one or two articles that were put out um, by the local campaign team in the international press that said, David Axelrod still consulting to that campaign. Um, nothing else came of it, and I understand okay. that the clients did not uh, continue to hire those consultants because they didn't think the information was useful. Well, there's further information about activities in other countries which, um, which colleagues want to talk about, but, mm -hmm. but um, those Israeli cyber security contractors that were referred to in this, uh, in this Guardian article, they, they came from this company, Black Cube, did they? Not to my knowledge. I have never heard the name Black Cube until I saw it in the press. Do you, do you know what, what company they came from? Um, this would have been the same company that we were talking about, um, but I believe that they were campaign consultants that had worked in African elections before. Okay, but had they been from Black Cube without your, your knowledge uh, of the name uh, uh, of the company that was employing them, uh, uh, it would have been true to have said that you arranged this meeting in, I, in London? Yes, I was present at that meeting, and yeah. I knew that they were coming. Okay, and what was your reaction to the activities? Well, you, uh, that was my next question, whether you were at the meeting. What was, I, what was your reaction to the activities that they described? Um, they showed me a video of sitting in campaign meetings uh, with the opposition, so I was kind of surprised that they had managed to achieve that, because they were actually sitting there with the candidate, campaign manager, other high-level individuals on the campaign. I never seen that before <laughs> from campaign consultants, so I was kind of shocked that they were able to I don't want to say achieve something like that as if it was great, but it was definitely um, shocking at, at their kind of skill level at going undercover and achieving that kind of trust from the other side. Um, but they obtained data while they were in that campaign, which I can't confirm how that was actually obtained, to be honest. Um, and then they presented that to me. I didn't think any of it was useful. And obviously the name David Axelrod pops out at me because I know the man personally and used to work under his direction. And so that piece of data was turned into a press article and that's all. Did it occur to you that that, that modus operandi going undercover like that was, if not useful, was unethical? It was something that I was quite used to in US um, politics. A lot of times opposition researchers are sent to become parts of local campaign teams or to take part in local rallies to and film people off camera. Um, to it's, infiltrate? Indeed, yes. So um, you were quite comfortable with that? It's commonplace in politics, fortunately or unfortunately. That's not here, I don't think. Um, <laughs> unless, I'm, unless I'm so naive um, <laughs> that I've been taken for a ride for the last 20 years. Um, um, I don't know, but I would say questioning the ethics of it is, is correct, definitely, in that, in hindsight, I'm no longer interested in being involved with, that, with activities of that sort. I mean, that Guardian article, which, you, you, which I'm referring to, goes on to talk about the the local uh, uh, various things that have, that have allegedly been, been obtained by this, this, this team of cyber uh, contractors and, and, and the team on the ground um, mm -hmm. uh, actually then panicking and, and pulling out. Were you, were, you, uh, did you, were you aware of all that? I was never aware of any um, panicking. Um, I was told that when the election was meant to take place, which is February 14th of 2015, um, we had only had people there for three weeks. The election was then pushed forward by a couple of weeks, and the clients did not want to um, to pay for the uh, our contractors to stay there for any longer. So they came back and did not stay in the country all the way until election day. And we, we've um, had copies of pretty horrendous video that was produced as part of um, part of that working campaign. Um, what sort of work on that campaign, including that video, were you aware of? Um, so I was only aware of all of the campaign materials at the end of the campaign when I was given the portfolio, which I've um, given as evidence to the committee. Now I do understand that there was um, one video that used uh, violent images. Uh, that was specifically because I was working with a lot of individuals that did not believe that um, Buhari was a legitimate candidate because he was a war criminal um, that had slaughtered people in the 80s, specifically children, and burned their bodies in the streets to initiate fear in the citizens. Um, so there were a lot of human rights lawyers that were trying to stop him from being a political candidate. And that was a reminder to anyone under the age of 30 who would have not been privy to that information, they would have not been born yet, um, of who that man actually was. So you're, that was part of the portfolio and you were, you were fully aware of it? Uh, at the end, yes. 
of the campaign? After it had already been pushed out and used, then I was made aware of the full campaign portfolio, yes. The, Phil, it's probably mm -hmm. first to, the core message was actually that he would establish Sharia law in Nigeria and that people would face punishment, beatings and death as a consequence of extreme Sharia law being introduced into the country more than his previous record. That's correct, isn't it? Um, you, you can look through all of the videos in the portfolio. There were quite a few, um, but I didn't produce them and I wasn't aware of them being produced. So you saw them afterwards? I saw them afterwards, You yes. saw them afterwards, but this was what, in 2015? Uh, yes, uh-huh. Um, did it not make you feel uncomfortable? Yes. But you stayed at Cambridge Analytica until 2018? I did, but a decision that would have been made by a contractor that didn't even work for our company that full-time that was running that campaign, gentleman under the name of Sam Patton, um, had nothing to do with the rest of the company. That was one video amongst about 50 or 60 pieces of creative that were put in local newspapers, radio, Facebook, Twitter. Um, so it wasn't concerning enough for me to quit my full-time job, no. Now take this information and add the fact that in the Netflix documentary, The Great Hack, all of the information regarding the 2015 project and the Nigerian election involving Kaiser's role and the Israelis was conveniently left out. Now listen to this information that has just been published on February the 15th, 2023. Published now for the first time reveals that the equal Israeli hackers of the same people who are at the centre of an investigative report that is also being published now. The team is headed by Tal Hanan, a provider of hacking and fraud services on a global scale, operating out of an office in the city of Mordenine, near Tel Aviv. Hanan's, Hanan's business is being revealed by a large number of media outlets worldwide as part of the Story Killers project initiated by the Paris-based Forbidden Stories organization dealing with the global disinformation for hire industry. The information about Hanan's activity was obtained via an undercover investigative report spearheaded by journalists from the marker Radio France and Haaretz who pose as potential clients got Hanan and his staff to talk about their activities in a series of meetings across about six months and documented their conversations. The content of the video clips from the meetings of Hanan and his team were later analysed by 10 journalists from Le Monde, The Guardian, Der Spiegel, Die Zeit, Paper Trail Media, the International Organization of Investigative Journalists, or CCRP, and other media outlets. In his presentations, the supposed clients, Hanan, who used the pseudonym George, gave a live display of hacked Google, Hotmail, and Telegram accounts of eight targets in four different countries. The services offered by the company, which identifies itself as Team George, include a falsification of documents, dissemination of fake stories, and an quote, army for hire of some 40,000 avatars, fake identities on social media platforms. These avatars are controlled by a software system called AIMS, which Hanan said was developed by his staff. According to the investigation, Hanan's company is responsible for conducting more than 20 political and business campaigns in various countries. Quote, they had Hispanic names. The emails are now being published, which were obtained in the course of the investigation by The Guardian. Quote, they had Hispanic names. The emails now being published, which were obtained in the course of the investigation by The Guardian, raised questions about the whistleblower's memory lapses during her testimony in the British Parliament. They show that Kaiser who had been Cambridge Analytica's business development director, had been in contact with Hanan for a number of years, and she in fact put him in touch with the company she worked for. On May 6, 2015, Alexander Nix, the CEO of Cambridge Analytica's parent company, SCL, wrote to Kaiser, quote, what's George's surname please, and also the name of his company. To which Kaiser replied the following day, quote, Tal Hanan, 
is CEO of Demo Man International an Israeli company owned by Hanan unquote, and attached a link to the site on which his bio appeared. In a testimony to Parliament, Kaiser also sought to dodge questions about that meeting in the London offices of Cambridge Analytica. She admitted having known that private medical documents belonging to Buhari had been obtained, but tried to claim that, to the best of her knowledge, the Israeli group had arrived at the information legally through a clandestine operation. Nevertheless, following a series of questions, Kaiser was forced to admit that she did not know how the personal information had been obtained. Like in her testimony in Parliament over the years, Kaiser refrained from divulging the identity of the Israeli hackers she had worked with. In September 2019, she was interviewed by the Sunday Times to mark the publication of a book she had written. This time, though, she volunteered an item of information that referred to Hanan, a.k.a. George. But they had a Hispanic name, she said. Okay, so the name George and Team George, they must be pronounced Jorge. And that's where the Hispanic name reference comes from. A possible explanation for Kaiser's disinclination to reveal Hanan's identity can be found in something he told us in the meeting we held with him in his Modini Inn offices last December when the conversation arrived at his ties with Cambridge Analytica. Hanan boasted that he and his staff were responsible for her landing the job in that company. One of the reasons the company contacted him in the first place, he said, was, quote, the main lady there, the whistleblower, unquote, referring to Kaiser, quote, who put her into Cambridge Analytica? We did, he added. So it was the Israelis that put her into the position in Cambridge Analytica, according to Hanan. Additional emails attest to the connection between Kaiser and Hanan and show clearly that she was his liaison within the firm. In January 2017, she sent a video clip showing an early version of AIMS, the software for creating avatars, an advanced version of which was shown to us in the series of meetings. Quote, it's our own developed semi-auto avatar creation and network development system unquote was how Hanan described a product in an email. In the meetings with us he claimed he had successfully delayed the election by means of a photograph of polling places in northern Nigeria part of which is controlled by Islamic organizations in which it could appear that women were being deprived of their right to vote. He explained that he thought postponing the election would benefit his client but the results show that it did not help. The election was indeed delayed for six weeks, but Jonathan still lost. If we take a look at Demo Man International, we find that companies full of ex and active military personnel from the Israeli Armed Forces. So how did the Israelis place Kaiser in her position in the company? Looking at Kaiser's background, we find she was born in Houston, Texas, but raised in a wealthy lakefront Lincoln Park neighborhood and Chicago's north side. She attended the Chicago Jewish Day School and was enrolled at the prestigious Phillips Academy, Anhover, Massachusetts, named the best high school in the US and described as an Ivy League feeder school. So we can confirm that she is Jewish from a wealthy family and well educated. In 2007, when she was 20 and in university in Scotland, Kaiser took time away from her studies to work with a digital team 
of the then Senator Barack Obama's presidential campaign. This is where she got some experience in the digital political realm, which would be an ideal backstory for her recruitment to SCL Group. Kaiser then pursued a career as a human rights activist while soliciting and getting gigs with business concerns and political parties in Eastern Europe and Africa. With her experience in Obama's digital campaign and connection to Africa, the Israelis must have sought her out and strategically placed her in SCL as a liaison in the company for their black operations. So how could they do this? Here is some background of the largest shareholder in SEL Group at the time of Kaiser's recruitment, Vincent Chenguis. Beginning in 2011, Black Cube, a private intelligence firm founded by former Israeli intelligence agents, provided intelligence services to Victor Chenguis in a number of cases, including Chenguis's fight against the UK Serious Fraud Office. Following his arrest as part of the SFO investigation into the collapse of the Icelandic bank, Kautfing, Black Cube analysed the network of relationships surrounding the collapse of the bank and helped build a successful challenge to the SFO arrests and search warrants, causing the judge to declare the FSO's actions unlawful in 2013. Following the investigation, the SFO was ordered by the court to pay over £3 million in damages and £3 million in legal costs to Cheng Weiss in 2014 and to issue a formal apology. In 2013, Black Cube filed a lawsuit in the UK against Vincent Cheng Weiss for unpaid invoices and breach of contract. Concurrently, Cheng Weiss filed a lawsuit in Israel against Black Cube alleging fraudulent invoices an allegation denied by Black Cube. Both lawsuits were dropped in a settlement agreement, the details of which are undisclosed. Despite the undisclosed details of the agreement, we know that Cheng Weiss went on to make large financial investments in the Israeli state of mind ventures overseen by former Unit 8200 director Pinas Bukris. Could this be part of the deal? And could there have been some cooperation agreement they have made with the Israelis on placing liaison personnel in SCL? It looks like that is the case here.